Yeah, so welcome. Um, I um, will talk about uh, building an automotive platform from GNOME. And I think I will slightly break with the all other talks, since mostly all other talks are talking about uh, desktop environments, how GNOME is used in this environment, or even servers, server, well, some services which are running on servers in the back end and so on. Um, GNOME I might even be used in mobile applications or mobile phones, um, but I think till now I haven't heard anything about the automotive environment, so this is a slight break. Um, while for the desktop you obviously are always aiming for latest changes, um, in the automotive environment you have a slightly different mindset since you want to have a very stable system. You are not really caring for the latest and best environment, but you want to have a stable system. Um, so, yeah, um, to show you some, so first of all, introduction, yes, sure. Um, so my name is uh, Lukas Nack. Um, I studied computer science at the RWTH in uh, University in Aachen. Uh, then I wrote my master thesis at BMW uh, Research and Technology, where I have special where I've specialized in machine learning and computer vision. And now I'm employed at Robert Bosch Car Multimedia GmbH. Um, and in this role, I'm working on an app framework system, Apertus, together with uh, the company Colabra. And uh, in this talk, I want to especially talk about this apparatus system, which is used in the automotive environment. First of all, a in short introduction about Bosch. Um, whenever I tell people that I work for Bosch, they think about power tools, machine, uh, washing machines, refrigerators, and so on. So I'm not working with power tools exclusively at least. Um, so what is Bosch? Bosch has more or less four parts. One is industrial technology, which is packaging stuff. So when you go to the next supermarket and the products are packaged somehow, this is done by some tech, uh, industrial technology, packaging technologies. Then the famous consumer goods, which are powered, powered tools, drillers, source, and so on. Uh, third part is energy technology, here we have uh, solar technology and um, larger energy-related uh, factories. And then the fourth component, more or less from Bosch, is mobility solution. This is the one I work for as well. Here we have gasoline systems, diesel systems, chassis, uh, starters generators, and then car multimedia, which is a part I work then precisely on. To give you an overview, um, so it's not the case that power tools are the biggest part, uh, quite contrary, 60% of the revenue is done with mobility solutions. So you can say more or less in every car you see on the road, there's at least one part of Bosch. Um, I think this is quite new to most people, um, at least to people I speak to. Uh, okay, so I work for Car Multimedia, as I said. Car Multimedia is mostly working on head units. Head unit might be a term you know or you know not. So a head unit is more or less the the d display you see in the car in the front. Um, in nowadays cars, it's a seven to nine inch screen, either usable by touch or by uh, buttons on the sides so or rotary type buttons, knobs, and so on. Um, so. What does it mean? So here's the head unit. This is now quite futuristic car. It was shown on the CES in Las Vegas this year. Um, this car does not only has a head unit yet, like you may see in modern cars, but has also an instrument cluster, which is, com which is completely um, controlled via a display. So in older cars, you have an analog uh, indicator showing the speed, the speedometer or the fuel level. In modern cars, you have a complete customizable screen where you can show all kinds of stuff right in front of you. If you go now a little bit into the future, you can even have passenger um, entertainment so that each passenger has its own display. Uh, either, yeah, so both the passenger itself or the rear seat entertainment can be then maintained by some central component in the car, some computer which maybe provides newest movies um, or music so that each passenger can have its own can have their own entertainment program. Last but not least, the faceplate. Um, in this example, the faceplate is again only done by software in this very futuristic car. Um, usually you see buttons or some touch display where you can interact with the head unit to start navigation and so on. Um, but uh, 
might, some of you have might seen the Tesla Model S. You have a huge, I think, 17 inch display and there are more or less no buttons anymore. Everything is handled via a display, a touch sensitive display, so even um, controlling the AC and so on. So this is a very futuristic outlook, uh, how it might look in the future. Nowadays, a head unit looks more like this. So again, seven to eight inch, maybe nine inch or 10 inch, mostly in the portrait or uh, landscape mode then. And by that, the head unit offers some convenience functionality. Mostly, of course, the navigation and route guidance. I think this is a one which is most famous for the head unit, but the head unit started with a radio and media playback. So in former times, you had the slight inter-exchangeable slot in the car where you can put in your radio. So this was also the very beginning of a head unit. Nowadays, they even can contain connecti connectivity, mobile phone, to for mobile phone or Wi-Fi. So the Bluetooth handling to play audio to call somebody is handled all by this one device. Um, even newer uh, than the smartphone integration functionalities, um, so to say the uh, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. In both cases, you can connect your mobile phone via USB or Wi-Fi with the head unit, and then the phone is taking over as complete control, more or less, of the screen, not of the car of course, but off the screen. So you see an Android running, uh, you can use uh, Google Maps for navigation or Apple, I guess, Maps for navigation, however it's called. Um, and then you can play music from your mobile phone and all of this is then distributed and uh, shown via the head unit to the end user, to the driver. Although the smartphone integration is very limited in functionality when it comes to vehicle data, so um, usually you don't want that the phone is controlling the brakes, the speed, and so on. So there's quite a, quite a few requirements uh, that these are integrated into the car. Other parts of the head unit are diagnosis and status of the vehicle. So you can see the tire pressure, you can see a fuel level. Uh, whenever anything stops or the oil is not enough anymore, then the head unit will give an indication about this. So all well, debug messages, so to say, of the car are integrated and collected by the head unit and then distributed to the user. Um, even when you go to the garage, there's even more uh, data the garage can ex, ex uh, can, can get from the head unit uh, because uh, yeah, all all our data is more or less collected by this one device. Um, other parts are then uh, park distance control and rear view con uh, uh, rear view camera uh, also. Although the rear view camera is quite far away at the end of the car, all of this data gets distrib gets uh, connected to the head unit, and then this one device shows uh, the content to the user. Climate control, as I said, in the Tesla, you have com complete control over the climate control via, via the 17-inch touch display. Um, not all cars have these. Um, by that, the head unit is nowadays deeply embedded, uh, so it's not really a choice of the user to use one operating system or the other. This is completely handled by the uh, car manufacturers. This is the reason, uh, the reason for this is the extensive testing which is needed in a car. Um, so uh, it's not, uh, it should never happen that the system crashes during the drive. This would be quite bad. Um, so the, the testing phase is usually several years, which is quite different for desktop environments where you distribute your code directly to the end user, more or less, like in a quarter or half year release. Okay, so to now to get to some challenges, uh, which you might not have uh, for the desktop environment. Um, first of all, the automotive industry is not really the fastest in adapting new, new um, technologies. This is, uh, um, for this, the reason is that the car has to provide some secure and safe environment. So if we are thinking 20 years back, um, if want someone wants to steal a car, he uses a screwdriver, uh, opens a car, and then hot wire some, car, some, some wires to start the car and drive away. Um, but this is past. So the car industry learned how to uh, protect the car against these attacks. Nowadays, the attack, uh, attacks are different. Uh, just two days ago, there was quite a big news that uh, Volkswagen cars are now um, can be opened without any problems. So millions of cars can be opened due to some technology bug in the um, keyless car entry mechanism. 
Uh, so if then it comes now to secure cloud connectivity and bridge to the vehicle, so that the vehicle, the car is connected to the cloud, gets di data from the cloud, this is a, well, for you, it, for you, it's not brand new. For the automotive environment, this is a complete new field. Uh, a very much increased uh, attack surface, and they have somehow need, the need to protect against this. Um, there was, uh, oh, sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Um, so I think one or two years ago, there was a quite famous Jeep, Jeep uh, Cherokee hack. Uh, so a Jeep car was hacked by some researchers. And there is an article oh, this, uh, so by the researchers Charlie Miller and Chris uh, Velizek. Um, there is a quote from the Wired magazine, uh, which tested this hack uh, that um, so the, the author of the article was driving with 70 miles per hour uh, on the edge of downtown St. Louis, and when then the exploit began to hold, this means the, at 70 miles per hour, the hackers were able to completely control the car, to turn off the brakes, first of all, turn off the engine, and then um, make a remote um, steering wheel change so that the car drove past the street into some uh, field. And all of this was re done remotely, so no attacker was attached by cable or was inside the car, completely done via a mobile phone or a laptop, complete remote control. Um, the problem for this at attack was that Jeep uh, was not really prepared for this new connectivity stuff, so they had an open port in their car, which was talking to the cloud. Um, the port was Open, it was a DBus port, uh, so you could easily distribute DBus commands to this, and one DBus command was root access, has had root access. Um, so yeah, you see, I could guess the car manufacturers did not really think about security in this sense, and by that it was possible to completely uh, use a car remotely. Um, so yeah, uh, this is. So far for security. Uh, besides that, most other challenges have been solved, but are not solved by desktop environments. So a, lang a long maintenance period expected. Um, the expected and supported lifetime of a car is around 10 years. So hardware and software should have a lifetime of 10 years. This is very unusual for desktop PCs. Uh, even more for mobile phones, you change your phone every two years, um, both for hardware and software reasons. So different for cars. Um, the car has to be robust against uh, under voltage and watching events. So whatever happens, if uh, something, so some emergency happens, there's no possibility that the system crashes. Uh, and even when the ignition turn is turned off, uh, there should be a uh, defined process what is happening. Um, then usually you, you don't want to create a system for each uh, car manufacturer, but you want to have one system which can then be adapted to the uh, original equipment manufacturer, so through the car manufacturer's wishes. This includes policies, user interfaces, and technology. So we want to have a generic system which can easily be adapted to different um, wishes. Um, with our system, which I will introduce, we provide a smartphone-like environment, so it's possible to install and uninstall applications. Um, this is very similar to Android or iOS, but then, of course, for the car. Uh, by that, it has to be reliable uh, for, up, for, of up, for updates. Um, so um, whenever you have an update of the system uh, over the air or in the garage, this should be reliable. There should be no excuse that the ignition is turned off or so on. So in, um, for mobile phones, usually they get a mess get message when you update your system, please do not turn off your phone. And you can only update the phone when it has reached a certain battery status. So this should be different for the car. Here we need to have a um, reliable update mechanism. OK. Um, then, of course, connectivity to vehicle data, so something like speed and so on, should be integrated into the system, and the system should handle it. Um, we have in reduced driver, driver distractions, which means um, that best example is if you are watching a movie, this movie should stop as soon as you are, well, if you're sitting in a car and you watch a movie, this sh movie should stop as soon as you reach a certain velocity. Uh, otherwise, the car driver will somehow be distracted by the movie. Um, and this is government law. This cannot be 
done. So we have to have some functionalities for this. Um, now, uh, last but not least on this slide, I come to a point where I probably are not very, not the most popular person here in the room. Um, we should not use GPL version three licensed software. Um, a lot of talks here were talking about the freedom of software, so I am completely with this. But GPL version 3 has introduced a feature which is called Tivoization, um, or Tivoization, I think, which comes from the Tivo systems, the uh, digital recorders, which record um, um, which you, the digital recorders which can, you connect to the television and which will then record some movies or shows. So usually it's not allowed to change the software, although they are based on Linux. Um, and to prohibit this, there was is an, an extend in the GPL version 3, who says if you are using our licensed software, you are not allowed, uh, you, you are not allowed to, to prevent uh, that end users changes the software. Uh, for the car, this is not thinkable. Uh, this is a highly secure uh, environment. If now each and every user can change the software, then there will be multiple death. So um, it's different for TIVO, TIVO systems. You have only some licensing problems for the car. It's very, very important that the car is, is safe, that no bugs are in the, in the car. And by that, it's mostly exclusive um, right to the car manufacturers to, to make some uh, um, changes to the software. Okay, now, long, long introduction. Let's go to the Apertus system. So Apertus is a free and open source GNU Linux based platform for infotainment in automotive uh, vehicles. So this first of all is uh, one statement. Now I go over this. Uh, what does it mean for Apertus system itself and how do we solve the different challenges I just um, introduced? Um, now, let's see. Apertus, first of all, uh, is an application framework. Um, it's an open source multimedia Linux derived distribution. So the Apertus uh, itself is based on uh, Ubuntu and by that on Debian. Um, it uh, is a vehicle compatible app ecosystem for managed application. Managed applications are applications in the world of the automotive environment. Um, so you can in uninstall, install applications. There's an updatability of applications. Applications have a life cycle. You can have um, 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 background running services and so on. Um, but by that, Apertus is not only this framework, but it's more. It's a complete holistic solution that includes embedded software, so the framework itself, some tools to interact with it, an infrastructure, which means uh, SDK portal, uh, and server for operating system updates, an SDK, uh, an app store, and uh, by that, the backend services and an enriched documentation. Uh, Apertus itself is heavily based on GNOME technologies. Um, by that, fortunately, it's highly customizable uh, and scalable, which is again then more or less our solution for the um, requirement that uh, the car manufacturers have their own ideas what they expect from the system. So Apertus is able to be quite scalable and customizable. Um, I already talked a lot about the security and privacy driven uh, or pr privacy in cars or more or less I talk about the security. Um, so uh, one moment. So yes, um, security is highly is a, is a high um, is a high value in the system. So from the beginning we uh, try to make the system as secure as possible by introducing more or less all Linux kernel security protocol functionalities we could or by trying to be, be the, to get the best of it. Um, and then, uh, then it's an app-centric solution and this is again very different to what you see on your desktop. Uh, on your desktop you have probably Debian files or with Fedora um, other packaging systems um, which where you install one package and the whole list of this uh, of dependent packages will be installed uh, so if you change one library to a newer versions a lot of dependency breaks will happen um, 
or can happen, it should not be like this, uh, but it can happen. So there's a deep dependency between all packages. Uh, with Apertis, we have not this system-centric solution, but we have an app-centric solution, which does mean that each app runs by its own. It can use the system's library, uh, but it does not need to. It can bring its own libraries, it can yeah, use whatever it wants. Um, if no two applications want to use a newer version, then the system provides each application has to bring this library in. Um, by that, it's com each app is completely independent of the other. All the system parts are licensed under MPL version 2, and documentation is licensed um, under the uh, CC by SA. Um, Yes, so far for the introduction to Apertis, one comment here. So Apertis itself should be used in the automotive environment. Uh, this means it's a commercial ecosystem. Although it's open source, of course, the goal is to bring it into market or to have it in market. Uh, so it's not just an open source platform, but it will be used in a commercial yeah, environment. Um, by that, of course, open collaboration for other parties is possible, app developers are needed, and so on. Okay, um, so as I said, Apertis is following GNOME principles. Um, we, well, you have mostly two big parts or um, groups, yeah, I think Qt and, and, and GTK or GNOME, uh, um, whereas GTK, uh, whereas Qt is very um, closed in its form. It provides all the functionality by its own, but it's, and it's hard to break out of the system. GNOME is completely different, I think. Uh, it's it's following the complete different approach. I have openness. You can uh, um, have multiple language bindings. You cannot you, you use whatever technology you want. Uh, so instead of encapsulation, GNOME implements um, openness. Uh, as I said, the system components can easily be exchanged by other solutions, um, and uh, this is especially visible with all the language bindings. So we have a native C or G object language, but, but due to the uh, language bindings, it's possible to extend this to Python, JavaScript, and so on. Um, so we use G object for uh, Pertis. Uh, extended this nowadays now to uh, slide. Well, we are in the progress, the process of uh, extending this to HTML5 web apps. Um, by that, we are using currently C and Dbus APIs for the system services. Um, or yes, so uh, yeah, I think I covered that. And of course, using by using C. Um, with C as programming language, you don't lose any um, performance due to higher level languages like Java, where you probably even today lose some lose some performance. Um, now let's go to the uh, application framework. Um, so the framework uh, in the framework we distinguish more or less between built-in applications and store applications. It's very similar to what Android or iOS are doing is doing. So uh, you have. Uh, built-in applications which are mandatory for the uh, framework to, that it works properly. This includes an internet browser, the App Store client, probably an email browser, and so on. So very, very um, um, important uh, applications. When you uninstall these, the uh, app framework will not work like it should be. But in uh, but it, you can also install uh, store applications and this can then range over the whole um, area, what you ever, whatever you think about. So Spotify clients, Facebook, um, what you name it. So Netflix client might make, make sense for a rear seat entertainment system of the car. So all of this can then the, be developed uh, for store applications and can be installed and installed by the end user. Um, an application bundle, so yeah, we, we call it application bundle. Application bundle is, an, is what you get from the App Store. So it's include, it's include then uh, all necessary information you need from application, which means application itself, all the libraries it needs when the system does not provide it, uh, an agent or multiple agents, which are then the services running in the background. Again, next, for example, a Spotify client um, will probably play all the mu music via an agent. So whenever then you leave the Spotify client, it, the music is playing in the background. Um, then we have a manifest file. Uh, the manifest file is used to explain what kind of application this is, what kind of permission this uh, application needs, um, and is by that some kind of metadata collection of 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 the yeah. Met it collects the metadata of the application. 
Uh, in the system, an application is identified by the reverse domain name. Um, as an example here, com.example.photoviewer. So this is very common, I guess, to all of you. Uh, so this, we use this general structure f all over the system for free desktop or desktop files to start applications or, um, for the G settings. Uh, so we use G settings for a persistent uh, atomic uh, way to save uh, the settings and preferences of an, of an application. We do use this for the data storage, so each application has its own private folder, and this private folder is identified again by this reverse domain name. Um, and as I said, Dbus is heavily used in the system, uh, so whenever uh, some applications are providing Dbus interfaces, these are provided again by the reverse domain name as Dbus uh, wants it to have it. Uh, I already mentioned the next point, private directory for each application, so this is one part of this independence between applications of this, uh, of this app-centric solution. Um, so in general, when the application does not need really in sh access to some shared folder, which is also possible, it has its own private folder where it can do whatever it wants. It can put their data, but it cannot, cannot, um, ex uh, cannot um, exit this folder. So. In, in general, an application does not have the possibility or the access rights to read any system resources or system data uh, when it does not ask for it precisely. Um, yeah, a shared folder is possible as well. In this shared folder, you can save music and movies, which are then um, accessible by all applications which need the right to do this. By that, we again follow closely to what iOS and M uh, Android are doing. Uh, applications should be treated by, its, uh, by their own. We have an application manager, uh, which is more or less a central component of the framework. Um, so it handles all of the interaction with applications, uninstalling, installing, updating. We have a rollback, uh, rollback functionality for applications. So all of this functionality is done by the application manager. Um, besides that, uh, maybe you know this again from your mobile phone. Uh, I think GNOME has it in now as well. When you open or has it, uh, when you open a text file and you have multiple possibilities to open this text file because you have multiple editors. Uh, we have an, uh, we handle this launching of MIME type specific data uh, using the application manager so then the user is, can choose what editor he wants to use to open the text file. With all of these uh, functionalities we follow as much standards as possible and these standards include of course a free desktop org standards, Geneva standards, and W3C standards. Uh, for all of you who do not know what Geneva is, so Geneva is an alliance, a non-profit automotive alliance of car manufacturers and car suppliers uh, who have the goal to have some uh, common open source solution for the automotive environment. Uh, in, this is slightly different to our Apertus system, which has uh, Apertus itself has a goal of an application framework, whereas GenEV is more is concentrating on a very low-level, stable system for highly secured uh, functionalities. Um, the GenEV Alliance was founded, I think, around um, seven, seven, eight years ago by BMW, GM, Intel, and some other um, companies. Okay, um, now I spoke again a lot of security, uh, so Apertus should be highly secure. Um, by that we implement multiple lines of defense, and this is done by AppArmor, so we are using AppArmor as res to restrict certain access to the system um, as mandatory access control. Um, so that the app, the app launcher is more or less um, configured to be in a whitelist approach. So in general, an application does not have access to anything on the system um, when it does not explicitly ask for it. And so this is handled by the manifest file. So the manifest file and application writes what kind of data it needs on, of the operating system. Based on this manifest file, AppArmor profiles are then configured. Uh, so AppArmor restricts API or access um, more or less. Um, C groups is used to restrict application uh, of the resource usage of applications, which means uh, CPU, uh, the RAM, uh, internet, uh, inter process communication, and so on is um, restricted by C groups. And then, in addition to AppArmor, we have PolKit, which has a 
which is more or less a second level security framework for context related authorization. I think the most prominent example for Polkit is on the desktop environment, the mount command. So usually a user is not allowed to mount, unmount uh, devices or, or uh, hard drivers, uh, with one exception, um, which is he's allowed to mount a USB drive. So this is done mostly by Polkit. Polkit recognizes USB drive as USB drive, and then the user is allowed to mount this. Um, yeah, in addition, uh, applications are restricted by the uh, by by user and um, by users and groups. So each user, each application is its own user, and by that has own uh, access rights to folders and directories. Um, updatability and robustness. So um, it, to um, Apertus is in contrast to most parts of the car more up to date and we try to integrate upstream solutions in the testing branch to test it. Um, by that we often uh, release cycle of three months. So every three months there's a new version of Apertus available, uh, which is every which is based on the newest Ubuntu version, which is, well, so every six months we are rebasing on the newest Ubuntu version. Uh, we have a system rollback functionality, which guarantees a reliable system even when the system is updated. So you can see on this um, slide here uh, the petition table of Apertus. Uh, we have an, a status flag petition, which is a binary petition. Uh, we have two minimal boot petitions. We have a system petition, which holds up to two uh, system snapshots, and then the general storage petition. Uh, the, when you start up the system, the st status flag is, um, gives the information about which minimal boot system should be used. Um, let's say we are booting now with minimal boot one, then the first snapshot of the system is uh, booted after, after that, or the root file system of the first snapshot is used, and all applications are laying in the general storage. Now, if a system update happens, uh, the update will uh, be put into the second minimal boot, and uh, the root file system will be put into the second snapshot. On the next startup, we try to boot now the second minimal boot. If the work system works fine, everything is uh, yeah, it's fine. Uh, if the startup does not work, so it breaks somehow, it will be recognized, factor and uh, we start booting with the first working environment, so first the first minimal boot. Um, and even if now both more or less systems we have are not working anymore, we have a factory recovery partition, which just is a very uh, basic environment and points out that to the user, hey, something is not working in your system, please go to the next garage to update the system. Um, I mentioned scalability. Um, so we would like to have a system which adapts very nicely to the uh, car manufacturer's needs. Um, sometimes the car manufacturer wants to have a full-blown system because he is, well, maybe operating as a premium sector of cars and uh, expect, expect of the end user that the end user is paying quite a bit of money for the hardware, then we can f give a full-blown uh, apparatus system with fancy animations, fancy graphics, um, with native applications, web applications, and hybrid solutions. But that's, this is not always the case. Uh, some other car manufacturers are not really operating in this high premium sector of cars. Uh, they are more or less restricting uh, the money that they want to give for hardware. And this means that the system should be scaled down to use less resources. Uh, this might be then, in the end, less animations, or even that the UI is completely missing. Uh, so in this case, we are speaking of an HMI or UI-less uh, apparatus system where only agents are running in the background. Um, a reason for such an agent-only system might be that the, end, that the car support a car manufacturer wants to have functionality like firmware over the air, and for this has an agent running in the background, uh, which checks if there is a new version of the system, um, but does not really have uh, s s some fancy animations. Um, so by this scalability, we select all parts of the system which are needed. Uh, we could um, we have resource footprints. So yeah, we have different resources which are needed, so the resource usage uh, scales well with the features we provide in our system. 
Um, I think I have to rush now a little. Um, so next part of web runtime. So this is currently in uh, development. We introduced uh, WebKit 2 GTK Plus, which is integrated into the system, uh, which offers now the functionality not to not only develop um, HTML, uh, not only G object and clutter based uh, applications, but also HTML5 and CSS uh, web applications. In the end, the goal is of course that you cannot really distinguish between these two uh, um, apps both in, in um, how you interact with them and in the look and feel. Um, we come back to this uh, GNOME uh, functionality since uh, GNOME offers the, with the G object introspection offers the uh, possibility to bridge uh, JavaScript uh, with GNOME APIs using Seed. So we use the Seed library or we'll use the Seed library uh, to bridge our APIs from the SDK to uh, to JavaScript. Um, by that, we are using same security mechanisms like AppArmor, Polkit, and so on to restrict access of uh, the web applications. And um, all this web runtime environment enables to, en to, to embed a very simple web page or a full-blown web application with multiple uh, pages or even hybrid apps which have agents running in the background and HTML5 application running in the foreground. So uh, an overview for you. Uh, some uh, libraries, we are, libraries we are using in our system. So first of all, the system is based on Wayland. We are using Mata as compositor. Uh, Clutter, MX, and Cairo are used for uh, the graphics system. Is uh, yeah using glib, gobject, dbus, and gsettings as basis more or less. Uh, for the connectivity, uh, again, I think the standard tools: Conman, uh, Ophono, um, Libsy, Bluesy, and um, Telepathy. I already mentioned security, which uses App Armor, C groups, and so on. Um, media again, a whole bunch of open source solutions. Uh, the same for web for web with WebKit 2, GTK, and for Geo information. Uh, now, so far, mostly the system is based on uh, ready-to-go solutions. Uh, here we now have. Uh, I will talk about a few adaptations we made, or a few contributions we made to the open source community so far. Um, so um, the UI customization is a concept which is introduced to um, especially cover the variant handling. Um, so when an application uh, is developed using ready to code widgets, he doesn't really care how the widget or how the, how the application uh, w w looks like in the end. All of this is done in the background by some UI customization uh, handling. So um, the specification of the widgets are based on, on ClutterScript. Um, yeah, um, and you can see two examples here. So uh, both pictures or figures you can see here on the side are showing more or less the same application with different which, uh, with a different variant in the background. Background. Uh, so the app developer has nothing to adapt here. He uses some standard image viewer and buttons uh, widgets, and then in the background, the more or less how how the system looks like is exchanged without that the app developer has to really to care. Um, this makes it very easy uh, to develop applications for multiple uh, variants of cars. Um, and yeah, uh, another point I already mentioned briefly is uh, the um, speed lock or uh, di driver distraction. This is uh, by governor mo is, is wanted by governor government law. Uh, specific features of the entertainment systems is not uh, are not allowed to be used when um, driving or. Yeah, when certain criteria in the car happening. So again, this is a functionality of your car customization. Um, if you're using the standard movie widget, uh, the movie will stop playing the playing it content when the car reaches I don't know five km km h or so. Um, so again, the app developer doesn't really has to care what is happening. This is done automatically, hopefully. Um, another uh, another part are automotive and oriented extensions. Uh, so um, here we are talking about automotive specific APIs which offer uh, access to vehicle data. Um, so in a car we have a lot of messages ongoing in, in a vehicle bus uh, which is um, covering the uh, speed, the angle of the steering wheel, tire pressure. So all of this co is covered by a D-bus 
uh, by, by bus message flow. Um, and with on sensor and actuators extensions, we want to have a functionality to uh, get this information to read all the sensor data of the attached electronic control units. Um, so yeah, um, uh, examples are given speed and so on. So this can be then uh, ex can be extracted from the card, can be it can be uh, given to the app developer that the app developer is using this information for uh, the for, for for the functionality. Um, in general, we try to restrict the wide access to this DAS bus. Um, so reading is absolutely fine. Writing the speed or writing whether the doors are open or closed are might be a security f floor. So we try to convince that these are not provided to the app developer uh, in the first phase place so that we by design have um, security in the system. Other extensions are geolocation and navigation. Um, so we re to retrieve the GPS status of the car to get some navigation route guidance and so on. Um, here again, uh, in contrast to the VE sensors and actuators, here we have uh, the functionality to get and set the data. So it should be possible for the app developer to get where the user is going or to set where the user is going to set a destination and to get to this destination. Um, all both these functionalities, so both the access to vehicle data and the access to some navigation system should be quite generic so that it can be exchanged either by directly attached hardware uh, like uh, electronic control units or a GPS module, or it can even be uh, replaced by um, cloud solutions. This might be an example for navigation. For navigation, we might have an locally running navigation system in the in the our framework which can give um, the capability to set a destination but this can even be done or via cloud that we set a cloud service to set the destination so um again the app developer shouldn't really care what is the background of this sdk api but um the uh, car manufacturer can decide whether he wants to use a cloud service or wants to have a local service and this brings me to the end. Uh, thank you very much for the attention. Um, you can find all information which I gave so far on apertus.org. You can uh, download the SDK. You can play with the system so it's completely free, free and to, free to use. Um, yeah, so far, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, questions, OK. There's another one. I, okay. There's another one. <laughs> um, hopefully. So uh, you mentioned. Uh, so you, you mentioned most of your system is MPL2, but it does include a number of sounds like LGPL and GPL components, right? As well as Linux. So I'm curious, how um, do you have a system to make sure that when car manufacturers put it in, that users can install new versions of executable? Install? Uh, install the executable uh, the, can can the, that includes the scripts used to control compilation and installation of the executable into the car. Huh. Good question. Uh, Philip, can you answer that by any chance or cat? <laughs> uh, so I, I am not very sure. I'm not too confident on all the licensing stuff. Um, so do you have by any chance more information about this cat? Sorry? No, okay. Sorry, um, I have to check that. I don't know. <laughs> I have two. One of them's really quick. Okay. Uh, previously, when I used to hack the Bosch navigation units, we had a really easy 32 bit field that we could turn on and off features. Yeah. So, like the driver distraction, we could just, you know, disable. Uh, is that a G setting now? Because that would be really convenient. <laughs> um, uh, so, <laughs> in the end, in an end product, uh, Apertis will be uh, used as an, uh, uh, probably as a second operating system. So we will have another operating system on which the local navigation system is running. And then we have an uh, Apertis, a second operating system running, which uh, gets only access through certain um, functionality of the native 
uh, navigation system. And by that, we do not change anything of the navigation system which is currently existing. Um, probably this will not be part of Apertus, but will be uh, in a highly secured environment, whereas Apertus is connected to the cloud and will probably more seen as a less secure environment where hackers can attack it um, if they um, somehow find an access to Apertus the other operating, very secured operating system on which the navigation is running should not be affected. Okay, and then my, my I guess, more real question is, uh, so it looked like you have an SDK with um, like a desktop SDK that you, the app developers, car manufacturers would be using to yeah. build their version of the navigation unit. Uh, what type of tooling is that? And are you looking for other tooling? Like, is it like an IDE that you guys provide? Is there like a yeah? So, um, so for the SDK itself, uh, we provide a uh, virtual box and environments which has a simulator of our Aperture system itself. Uh, programming is done via Eclipse as an IDE, which includes some basic wizards uh, to start uh, development and so on. Um, we will probably extend the SDK to have a vehicle simulator which simulates uh, the speed and um, GPS position. Um, so in the end you can, yeah, um, we have an SD comp complete SDK. Uh, it has all the help, help files included, sample code. Um, yeah, so Eclipse is a uh, ID. So, uh, have you seen the uh, Flatpak sessions, and have you considered using Flatpak in the product? Because I saw you mentioned you use C groups and that kind of stuff, and I yeah. was wondering what were your thoughts on um, consideration. So, unfortunately, I haven't seen it, uh, but I know that we were asked if we want to do it. So, when it was still what it, when it was not uh, called Flatpak, but a X XDG uh, app. Um, and then I have uh, here I have to go back to the different requirements we have in the automotive environment since we cannot really adapt to all news changes. Um, so it is I would assume that this technology will evolve over the next next couple of years. We'll have dramatic changes in the API and so on. Um, this is not really something the automotive environment can handle since we have to support ten years of lifetime. So we really have to take care that what we are using in technology is very stable and we cannot always use the newest one. Um, but we are using all of the same underlying technologies, so there is a lot of alignment there. And in fact, being the flatback author, it looks exactly the same Okay. a high-level perspective. Okay, then it's just called differently. <laughs> Um, is it planned to include an option to unlock the bootloader or something else if a car manufacturer busts up after 10 years? Um, I guess not. <laughs> um, so whenever you open up such a system, uh, hackers will distribute uh, their code over the system and will probably introduce bugs. And even after 10 years, a car will drive on the road and um, it really will be yeah, yeah, and this is the point because um, my dad is a car fan, and he knows that w people are already avoiding young timers because they know the software is closed source, not available, and in ten years these cars can't drive. And if we have WebKit in the system, there hmm. will be security holes. Yes, that's true. So um, someone needs to be able to fix them. So. I think about a fallback hook um, at a lawyer who says, okay, um, GM busts up, okay, open source, unlock the source code, everything is uh, published so people can rescue their cars. Uh, uh, yeah, I think um, this will be decided probably in around five to ten years when the first cars reach this, this, this age. Um, but I'm still convinced that uh, if you open up 
the source code, you can do more harm than good. Uh, even if there's a large or big flaw in the WebKit, uh, which can be easily uh, exploited, um, I guess this is still better than open up a complete system. And um, but I, I'm not too sure about this. So uh, the car manufacturers are. I think they need to th change their thinking in general in this direction uh, because all of these infotainment systems, all in multimedia and connectivity to the cloud is brand new. They do not really know how to handle this. Um, so probably this will change, um, but I do not see it in the near future, at least. I hope so. <laughs> So um, I'm a recovering car guy, and I've reverse engineered a lot of Bosch components on a lot of vehicles. That's um, interesting. <laughs> and one thing that's always been a giant pain in the ass is getting the diagnostic codes from the car versus the uh, you know the standardized code standardized standardized codes versus the actual like Bosch codes for what's failing in a component. And now you have a screen in the car. One thing that could save me many, many weekends so that I can keep fixing the code that you're using in your cars would be to actually print me out the real air messages that are manufacturer specific, I mean, which are really Bosch specific. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I don't want to have to keep going to a dealer to fit. I mean, I, I wouldn't take it to a dealer anyway. They're just going to ruin it. But, um, I wouldn't have to reverse engineer so much stuff to figure out why some solenoid is failing if it just told me. Um, I guess Bosch does not really want you to reverse engineer the system in the first place. So each and every f functionality they offer in this area will probably not happen since uh, they try to secure the system as much as possible. Um, yeah. Um, so I think it's a race Bosch against you, probably. Um, <laughs> and no party wants to help the other parties, which is, I think, common, isn't it? So, uh, so you said that putting GPLv3 software in cars will kill people and that opening up the source code to cars will cause more harm than good. I can give you a few examples of proprietary software in cars that have already killed people. Okay. Please give us the example that where open source software, that software that was opened up has killed people like proprietary software already has. I do not say that, well, this is very hard to say uh, since you cannot really point to one software component which kills now the people. Uh, <laughs> the guy was killed by the, by the Tesla auto driving system already. Yes. It's already happened. Proprietary software in a car has killed someone already. Yes. And the VW emissions is killing us slowly because they used it to pollute the environment more. So that's slow kill. There's been fast killing and slow killing. Show me the open source software that's killed people already in cars. Well, Tesla is using a lot of open source as well. Um, the, the driving system wasn't open source. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I don't doubt that you all are guys have the best uh, in your mind to help all people, um, but there are others who will definitely do differently. So if uh, it's possible to, well, um, I know that this point would, sorry? Uh, how do you expect then for automotive vehicles? How, how should this be handled? So there are a tremendous amount of so there are large groups which spend a tremendous amount of work to figure out the perfect uh, reactions to any given scenario in an uh, autom in the, in, on the street. If now someone is able to fiddle with these values to change one value, which leads to another change and so on. So of course this might help, but it does not have to help. Code being available and anyone being able to install or record it 
Uh, well, not in this case, since I'm only speaking about the Tivoization. Um, so I'm not against open source at all. Uh, we will happily contribute uh, open, open uh, source as much as possible. Uh, I'm only speaking about this one specific point uh, that it might hurt the system if someone gets access to the hardware, can uh, change the boot sequence and so on. So this is the only point. I'm not against open source at all. So. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here, and we wouldn't have this open source solution. Just to uh, clarify, all of the purchase is open source code, so it's already available online. Uh, what uh, Lucas was talking about is that the parts which are not open source, parts which are uh, top speed, uh, which control uh, the vehicle, the ACU, and so on. The, yeah. We already have that, though. Uh, um, but that is not the part that affects us. And that is currently still closed to us. We can't change it overnight, although possibly we should be working towards that. But we can't install, we can't actually hack on that. Um, I on, on the car. No, you've got a car with a possibility. On the car, should be at the moment you can't. Um, I'm sorry, but I think we have to divide this in two parts. A purchase seems to be about onboard entertainment and not for, not for motor unit. Um, with self-driving yes. things and with other stuff. Yes. These are completely different things. Well, the difficulty is and you bus to CAN bus translation access, right? So if you can get into that and you can start making CAN bus calls, you can start talking to the ECU controller and start controlling the windows and opening the windows and talking to your car. Yeah, I know about this hex at HiSE and Raspberry Pi and measuring your messages on the CAN bus. They are cool. Um, but I think we just need to divide this. But uh, other thing, a feature request um, regarding on you. Um, please, please include an option to print out the OBD2 messages on the multimedia system. Yeah, that yeah, would be yeah. awesome. We definitely don't want the OBD2 messages. <laughs> we want the manufacturer messages. I think in the, in the end, the cars do not even have this data anymore because uh, they're end of line parameter than a car, uh, which prevent these messages to be shown uh, in any case. So this is decided by design that they are not there anymore. They are, you mentioned just earlier that, you know, uh, modified uh, cars with modified firmwares would kill people. There are already laws, there are already laws to, uh, if you modify a car beyond its original shape or, or features, you're supposed to go through tests that your government is supposed to to uh, to offer. You're going to pay for those. It could very well that uh, people want to go through the trouble of changing the software on their cars uh, because in a number of cases, we're going to end up uh, with cars with the same problems as Android phones right now. The manufacturer only cares when it's the current model. In, in a couple of years time, you won't be able to get security updates for your car. Your car will be, I mean, there are already uh, major problems with uh, different bits of technology used in cars. That means that you can steal a very expensive piece of equipment. Brake by wire, fly by wire, steer by wire. These are three terrifying things to give access to in 10 years time when I'm doing, you know, <coughs> full speed, middle of the turn, and my steer by wire goes out. I cross the lane right into a bus. So I think that the uh, saying that we don't want to, uh, we can't make those bits open source or we can't allow the user to replace the, uh, the firmware and the software on those machines is because of security reasons. We know that the manufacturers aren't going to be uh, on, on going to be maintaining all that code forever, and there's going to be bugs, yeah. and there's going to be there's going to be ways in which particular manufacturers will cheat just a little bit. If you see what I mean, it's if the code was out there. Um, if the code was replaceable, we could go and inspect it. We could go and and modify it, we could go and make it better and fix those bugs, and we could make sure that our cars don't suddenly become huge security holes in, in a couple of years' time. 
Uh, I guess it's an endless discussion we can have here. Um, so I, I assume the cars, car manufacturers have to adapt to changes here and are quite outdated in their opinion towards such stuff. Um, but currently, at least, it's not thinkable that they change their view on, on this topic. Um, I cannot say more to this. So I work for Apertus, which is completely open source. Um, I don't know about the other system. Um, and I at least cannot do anything about the licensing. So I, I have just sort of an addendum to that, which is I think maybe one thing that would be valuable that you could take back yeah. to Bosch would be uh, when they're talking about fixing security bugs 10 years down the line, um, think about what the Linux kernel was like 10 years ago, what GTK was like 10 years ago and all that. If uh, I think it would be valuable for the company to consider what the maintenance burden they're taking on is if they have to maintain all of that stuff just by themselves for 10 years. So um, you consider not only how many bugs are there going to be, but if the more closed you keep that part of the system, the more the burden is on you for 10 years and for also the car that's nine years old and eight years old and seven years old. So I think that may be something they should uh, explore the cost of that may not be thinking of right now, but in five years it may not seem as beneficial, maybe. Uh, uh, I share just... your opinion, yes. Sure. Um, but uh, the car manufacturers itself do not really think in this, um, in this scope. Um, yeah. VW and their engines to gain trust back and I've already written them an email, a lengthy email because I know that their CEO is an IT guy marketing blah blah back in the response email and I think this was for last and biggest chance um, to make up their mind but they ignored it and they decided to do the same things like in the past but I think security and open source and cars will be become more important and you're right in long term. Just comment. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I, so I'm not disagreeing with all of you. Uh, I just know for a fact that this will probably not change um, due to a couple of reasons. Looks like we're done. Thank you a lot, Lucas. Thank you as well.